Hello, I'm Christina Davis, the director of the program on US-Japan relations. And it is my great honor to welcome you to our seminar today. We are going to be joined by Professor Mark Ramsayer, who comes to us from Harvard Law School as the Mitsubishi Professor of Japanese Law and a leading expert on the law and economy of Japan, who also teaches courses on corporate law and is well versed on a range of topics of interest to many of us here. He is also a new member of the Faculty Advisory Committee of the Program on US-Japan Relations and has helped in our interest to engage more with scholars of Japanese law. And we're really happy that this year our program brings affiliates from the Japanese Ministry of Justice, Police Agency, and a judge. And so we're really excited to look more closely at Japan law and lessons to be learned. Uh, Professor Ramsayer will introduce our speaker, Professor John Haley, and moderate the session today. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, you know, uh, people remember uh, the people who were nice to them when they didn't have to be nice to them. Uh, and uh, every professor was a graduate student or a law student once. Um, every uh, professor was, um, uh, wrote an art, you know, most of us when we were graduate students or law students, we wrote to somebody famous, we had some questions, uh, we showed up at a conference, we tried to say hello. Uh, and usually these uh, letters got no response. Uh, and uh, when you said hello, people look kind of irritated at you at, at a, a conference. Um, all of the professors too uh, wrote a first article and they wrote a second article and they wrote a third and in the first three articles um, basically all of us uh, we made the usual terrible mistakes that everybody makes with their first articles uh, and we submit these and for the most part the they get rejected by um, editors with a uh, cursory formal uh, rejection letter right but I think most of us, you know, there were a few people uh, who uh, answered our questions carefully when we wrote them. There were a few people who, when we saw them at a conference, would actually uh, buy us a cup of coffee and talk to us for a while. Um, and then there were these editors who would um, write back with uh, three-page uh, letters telling us what we were doing wrong with these uh, initial uh, articles. and. When this happens to somebody, basically we, we remember this for the rest of our lives. Um, and, um, and John is a person like that for me. Um, you know, John paid attention. Uh, John was nice to me when uh, there was no reason in the world uh, for John to be nice to me uh, and to help me when I was getting started and giving me advice. Uh, and, um, you know, I will, I will never forget this. Um, John, uh, was for many years uh, the uh, principal person uh, at the University of Washington. Uh, he started uh, his uh, academic studies at uh, Princeton, where he attended the school formerly known as Wilson. Uh, then he went to law school at what probably will soon become the school formerly known as Yale. Uh, but uh, his first teaching position was at the University of Washington. Uh, and it was there that uh, he revolutionized this field. Um, his, uh, one of his very first articles there, uh, The Myth of the Reluctant Litigant, really turned everything upside down. Uh, and uh, it became, uh, and has been ever since, uh, John Haley's field. Uh, he, he created this uh, for us. Uh, I remember uh, when I was a law student, uh, I, was, I, I ran across uh, another article of John's uh, on antitrust. Uh, and uh, it took uh, enormous numbers of Japanese court cases uh, and handled them with the dexterity and the flexibility and the, uh, and the, the, the finesse that the best law review articles um, in America uh, handle uh, American uh, cases with, right? So um, it was doing exactly um, what uh, the very best American law review articles do with American cases to Japanese cases. 
Um, and it's, it's not as well known now because it's been overshadowed by, uh, frankly, um, uh, revolutionary uh, articles like the myth of the reluctant litigant. But I remember at the time reading this in the library uh, and reading it carefully and going over it and saying, you know, looking at what he's doing. Uh, because I was saying to myself, uh, literally, I want to write an article like this. Uh, this is the kind of article that I want to write. Uh, and I spent a lot of time that evening at the in the library uh, just trying to figure out how it was that uh, John did um, uh, what he did. Uh, I also thought to myself, you know, someday I want John Haley to know who I am. Uh, and so that became uh, my, the first of my career goals. Um, then uh, after being at uh, the University of Washington, uh, John Haley moved to Washington University. Uh, and of course, I uh, at that point needed to tell my friends in Japan that he was moving from Washington Daigaku to Washington Daigaku. Uh, and I had to tell them that uh, the second Washington Daigak was in uh, Missouri. Uh, and, um, you know, that, that is what it is. Uh, and then from there, uh, he went uh, to Vanderbilt, uh, and he is now uh, emeritus. So uh, we welcome John Haley. It's been it's wonderfully generous. Of, he's been a wonderfully generous man all his life. Uh, but at this point, it is wonderfully generous of him to come uh, speak to us. Uh, and I will... Uh, handle the questions afterwards. So if you have a question, uh, please put your blue hand up. Uh, and I hope uh, you can figure out how to do that. It's the standard uh, Zoom. Uh, I will call on you. Um, and I have a class at one o'clock. Uh, so um, I will uh, need to leave a little bit early, uh, but uh, Mr. Fujihira uh, will handle things for the last few minutes. Um, and you have before you uh, Zoom etiquette, uh, so uh, keep yourself muted, muted and let, until you want to speak. Uh, raise your blue hand. Uh, this is being recorded, uh, so, you know, um, take that into consideration. Uh, and uh, John, uh, it is now up to you. Okay. Oh, excuse me. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and uh, this is ne this is uh, next week's. Um, well, I should after that introduction, I should let Mark know that I was aware of who he was and his research before he ever knew anything about me, because I read his student note in the Harvard Law Review. It was on dealt with some cases that I had been working with, and I knew that that this, he must have had the, these cases immediately when they came down, and he must have been aware and indeed must have done much of the research even before the decisions were made. It was, in my view, and still is, one of the best student notes on Japanese law ever published. In any case, that's how I met Mark, and I've followed his career ever since. Uh, the, today's topic, or my topic uh, t this morning, is the Japanese criminal justice system. And I should tell you that I first began work with the Japanese criminal justice system back in the early 70s. So before I started teaching, I was working in a law firm in Tokyo and the senior partner, Tom Blakemore, uh, called me into his office and said, could you please accompany uh, a person coming from Philadelphia, he was the chairman of a Philadelphia Crime Commission, who is studying Japanese criminal justice system, and he's going to be uh, talking with some prosecutors in the Ministry of Justice. And John, would you go with him because it, it may, he may need a translator. Well, we got there and the prosecutor who he was interviewing, his English, the prosecutor's English was far better than my Japanese, so I just sat in the chair and, and, and s said nothing. But what occurred at that meeting uh, among other things, was the, the, the American asked the Japanese prosecutor, how do you account for the low incarceration rates in Japan? And the prosecutor said, we don't believe in incarceration. We think that prisons are the schools of crime. 
And that began uh, my study of Japanese criminal justice procedures and process, not, not the formal codes and the law itself, but, but what happens to people who, how do you determine the person is a defender and what happens if they're determined to be offenders? And why does Japan have such a low incarceration rate? Uh, how can you, how does that happen? And much of that research was published in 1982 in a piece I did for the Journal of Japanese Studies, which is available to the participants, uh, or you can email me and I'll be happy to send you a copy. Uh, that piece describes the Japanese criminal justice system, and I've continued to work with the data uh, from that time on. Uh, finally, a couple of years ago, I decided that Japan was more successful by far than the United States. In fact, uh, the, the American system I thought of as the night of criminal justice, where the Japanese system was the day. And what makes the Japanese system the day in part is it's, it has one of the lowest crime rates of any industrial democracy. It has the lowest incarceration rates of any industrial democracy. But what I discovered that for over 50 years, Japan has had a declining number, not rates, number of violent crimes and other major offenses. Uh, and so you see in front of you uh, two graphs that I put together showing the reported incidences. These are the actual numbers of homicide and rape from 1955 to 2016, and then uh, injury and assault from the same period. And then that upper line on the second chart shows population increases. So even though population is increases, the numbers of violent crimes has gone down. And has gone down particularly with re in relationship to homicide and rape quite dramatically. Why is this the case? How can you explain this? Well, of course, there are a variety of cultural factors that explains why Japan has low rates or low incidences of crime generally and violent crime in particular. And they're well known. Japan is one of the most homo ethnically homogeneous societies in the world. If you think about it, Japan had no major migration and no conquest until Second World War in its two, in over 2,000 years. So virtually every Japanese can assume that all, every one of their ancestors was on those islands, one of those islands for over 2,000 years. That, that creates a very homogeneous population. The secondly is that Japan has a relatively equal distribution of, of wealth. Uh, it, it changes every once in a while, but the Gini index in Japan is, is very low, not the lowest in the world, but, but quite low. And given a population which is half of ours, it, that's quite uh, extraordinary. And then Japan is a highly communitarian society. Uh, people work with each other in communities. Family is important, but the working group that you're with in a company or a bureaucracy becomes even more important. And you spend, in fact, uh, as much, if not more time with your coworkers and you're interrelated. Now, this is true not only in corporations, but it's true in the bureaucracies, particularly the legal bureaucracies. Judges, prosecutors must pass, as well as lawyers, must pass one of the most difficult, if not the most difficult, public examination given in Japan. I think the highest rate of passage is around 7%, uh, but the average is less than 5%. To become a judge, a procurator, or a lawyer, you must pass this exam and go through a training program of a year and a half. And then the Ministry of Justice invites prosecutors, the judiciary invites the judges, uh, and the first assignments are in very far apart parts of group parts of Japan in the far north and the far south, and then you tend to be located <coughs> more permanently in, in a one of the major areas. Uh, another factor in Japan that I think may explain low crime rates, aside from these, is just the, the human uh, and geographical uh, context. 
Japan has a population roughly half the size of the United States, but Japan is only as, about as large as California. And 80% of Japan is not arable. So you have half of our industrial production, half of our um, uh, population is pushed into what would be 20% of California. That creates a very dense society and given the communitarian orientation produces a society in which everyone understands that crime hurts everyone. Now, uh, the process I believe is as important as these factors and it's the process that has not been explained adequately. When I first introduced to this process <coughs> in the 70s and then wrote about it in the early 80s, I wanted to find something in the United States that could show that the process worked in the same way in the United States. And the only organization that I could find, at least then in Seattle, was a newly organized uh, group called <coughs> the Victim Offender Reconciliation Program. It had just been formed. I became involved with it, indeed was the chair of its board uh, for a decade. But it had a hugely difficult time becoming a central part of the criminal justice system, at least in Seattle, because the prosecutor's office did not like them. They had created a victim's group that they basically influenced, and the prosecutors involved with that victim's group called the the VORP, Victim Offender Reconciliation Program in Seattle. It was the Invite the Offender to Lunch Program. Um, <laughs> but they're all over the country. They'd started in Indiana. It was started by Mennonites. It was an incredibly interesting and successful program to the extent it was allowed to become central. And, but there are very few parts of the United States where Victim Offender Reconciliation or now we call, talk about it as restorative justice, was an essential part of the criminal justice system. Now, in New Zealand, without a victim offender reconciliation program, restorative justice became mainstream. And they began to use this as an alternative to incarceration. And this was copied in Australia without social workers as the mediators, but now with police as mediators. Uh, and it had remarkable success, <clears throat> at least in helping victims. There's some question about how effective it has been to uh, in uh, re reducing reoffense by offenders, but I suspect, although I haven't seen the data, that most offenders, even if they go through a mediation program or restorative justice program, in fact, uh, are prosecuted and may face in incarceration. Japanese do not. And let me turn to uh, some slides. Uh, and I'll explain how the Japanese system works. Who are offenders in Japan? Well, there are three separate processes for determining who, who is deemed to be an offender. The first has to be a crime that's committed, et cetera. But the police make the first investigation and the police make a determination by the police of who's an offender. The second is by prosecutors and they make a separate determination uh, for purposes of determining whether to prosecute. And then of course, there is the trial and the, the determination by uh, judges, there's no jury, uh, judges who uh, was the offender. You should note, in contrast to the United States, that there's no bail in Japan. Uh, so in all cases, <clears throat> you would, if you detain a person, they're detained without bail. But I've, I don't know the statistics, but I am pretty sure that there are no, quote, jails in Japan in the same sense that we have. They're detained, they're interviewed, uh, but these are short term. The longest period that you can be detained in Japan without a separate court warrant is 23 days. There's a study that shows in the United States the average time a person spends in jail, and 
a significant portion of those are turned out to be innocent is actually the average time is exactly the same, 23 days. There's no guilty plea in Japan. So confession is not counted as proof of guilt. You must, the prosecutor must prosecute with, if they go to court, must prosecute with evidence aside from confession that the person is guilty. But what actually happens? As indicated in this particular graph, the police determine first who, is, who are the offenders. And then the police can report, except for tri trivial offenses, to prosecutors, persons that they have deemed to be offenders. But prosecutors don't report very many, or at least a significant mi uh, minority of those they have determined to be offenders. Between 30 and 40% of all persons determined to be offenders by police are not reported to the prosecutor. There's no- Hi, Professor Haley, yes. I'm sorry to interrupt. I just wanted to let you know that your slides are actually not showing. Um, well, and so- Not showing? You, yeah. So um, just wanted to, I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, but I, I think um, if, you, if you had sort of, I know the charts you're talking about, so I think it's- well, I, I don't, uh, well, I, let, I'm not sure how I can change the slides, but. Okay. I'll I'm explaining the slides so you don't really need to see them. They just are a lot more interesting than my face. In any <laughs> okay. case, so these are, Bizai Shogu, these are disposition, disposition of trivial crimes, minor offenses, but it includes assault, theft, fraud, embezzlement, and gambling. And I said 20 to 40% of all cleared cases, so we now know the number of cases, are never reported to the prosecutor. Those that are reported by the prosecutors, and remember the prosecutors are as qualified as judges, it's a national bureaucracy, uh, it, they pass the most difficult exam in Japan, uh, I'm gonna, and the prosecutors do not prosecute, and this has been true for over, 40 years, less than 50% of all determined offenders are ever prosecuted. In, in some years, it's up to 65%, and at one year, I thought it was up to 70%. That is, over 50% of persons determined by the prosecutors to be offenders are never prosecuted. Prosecution is suspended. Of those that are reported, now we're having you know, 30 to 40% not reported to the prosecutors, 50 to 70% not prosecuted. Those that are prosecuted are almost always determined to be guilty. Uh, there's no jury <coughs> and there's no, as I said, no guilty plea. But in the vast majority of cases, there's no defense. Prosecutors must show the, the evidence to show guilt besides confession, but there's no, there's no defense and the vast majority, 95 plus percentage, are found guilty. What happens to those that are found guilty? Well, in better than 50%, judges suspend execution of sentence. So what happens is, and some of those sentences are just fines, but in better, in, in less than 2% of all persons determined to be offenders in the courts are ever incarcerated, oh, excuse me, of all offenders, period, are ever incarcerated. And thus Japan has the lowest rates of incarceration of any country in the world. Now we go back and say, my goodness, they believe that incarceration or jail or prisons are the schools of crime and they don't incarcerate. Well, which offenders are incarcerated? Which offenders are tried? Which offenders are prosecuted? And which offenders are reported besides, within the category of trivial offenses, are reported by the police? And what you find, and what I've found in over 40 years of looking at this, is that there is a clear, discernible pattern. If the offender admits guilt, shows remorse, 
apologizes, and is accountable to the vict any victims, and negotiates with the victim for a settlement, and the victim accepts, forgives, the police are far less likely to report it to the prosecutor, the prosecutor is far less likely to prosecute, and the courts will not execute the sentence. They don't go to jail. And then the question is, does this have some bearing on the reduction of crime in Japan? And I believe it does. I believe that you can go back and look at the Japanese data if you wish, but I plead to anyone listening to this talk that they would find someone who's willing to do the research necessary in the United States to find some place where a person who has admitted they have committed a crime, shown remorse for that crime, and is willing to be accountable, is not prosecuted or not put in jail or prison. I think it's rare that that could happen, but I believe that the likelihood of reoffense goes way, way down. And the recidivism figures for Japan that I've seen, there are not many studies, show that the least likely persons to, offenders to reoffend are those the police have never returned reported to the prosecutor. The next most least likely to reoffend are those the prosecutor doesn't prosecute. And the third least likely to reoffend are those that never go to prison. And the most likely to reoffend are those who serve time. That is my story. And I will stop there and let anyone have questions that would like to ask. Thank you, John. Uh, that's Let's see if I can get out of this. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yes, that's a, that's a wonderfully uh, in, in, um, inspiring of comment uh, talk, uh, and um, we've uh, so uh, we thank you. Uh, we've asked two people from the uh, National Police Agency if uh, they would ask uh, questions first. Oh, yeah. uh, so this is um, Ms. Maihara. Uh, and Mr. Kawagishi, uh, and if they could each uh, give your questions, uh, and then John, uh, you could respond to both together. Yes. So, uh, Ms. Maihara, you are, you need, there you go. Yes, uh, thank you for a very interesting lecture. I'm Shihon Maihara from National Police Agency of Japan. Let me ask you a question in relation to what you talked about Removing from the criminal process, such as the uh, disposition of police, prosecutors, and trial court. Uh, in Japan, the number of crimes is down, but the crime rate among the elderly is increasing. In terms of preventing recidivism, some scholars argue that it is not enough to simply remove a person from the criminal process, but the efforts should be made to connect them to medical affiliate if they need medical care for dementia, for example. Like this idea, do you think that is there anything else should be done in Japan in addition to removing them from the criminal process? Thank you. Great. And, uh, and before you answer that, John, um, Mr. Okay, Kamaki. Go ahead. Hey. Thank you for your presentation. I am Takuma Kawagishi, Superintendent of the National Police Agency, Japan. My question is uh, regarding, regarding confession. In summary, you mentioned that uh, Japanese police or prosecutors like to get confessions of the suspects. I think it is part, partly true, but there is a more practical reason there. It is often said that the Japanese law enforcement has limited legal ability to obtain objective evidence. For example, Japanese police seldom did legal wiretapping because of its very strict requirement. Our research showed that in the late 2000s, the case of wiretapping by Japanese law enforcement was only around 30, while the US was around 2000, and the French was around 12,000. Or in Japan, even using video cameras in order to record behavior of the suspects, 
is sometimes difficult in respect to human rights. So some people, th some people will think that the limited ability to get objective evidence compelled the Japanese police to resort to obtaining confessions in order to prove the suspect's guilty. My question is, what do you think about such a statement? Thank you. Can I answer both? Uh, please, by all means. I, I agree with both. Uh, there's no question in my mind that the police prosecutors want confessions and they value confessions because if there's a confession, then the offender is more likely to disclose evidence which will prove guilt. There's no question in my mind. Uh, the difference with the U.S. is remarkable because U.S. prosecutors want confessions, they want a guilty plea, and they negotiate with the offender, but they don't say, hey, incarceration is off the table, there's no, there's going to be no prosecution if you confess. They say if you confess, the period of time in which you are incarcerated may be lower, et cetera, et cetera. We will charge you less. There's still going to be a trial. There's still going to be a likelihood of some penalty, some punishment being imposed. But I think both questions go to another point that uh, intrigues me. I've been, as Mark said, I've been working on Japanese law for all of my career. And I generally say good things about Japan because I look for the good things about Japan. And what, what I find remarkable is that both Japanese criminologists and Americans who study Japan and the criminal justice system tend to look at the negatives in Japan. They look at what's wrong with Japan. And I say to myself, but, but you're an outsider. Your purpose is not to criticize Japan and tell Japan what to do. Your purpose is to find what Japan does well and to suggest that there's some things we might learn from Japan. But I've always, I've thought for a long time that Japanese really prefer to learn. They want Americans to tell them what's wrong so they can learn from it. They want Americans to tell them what's better about the United States so that Japan, Japan can improve itself by learning from the United States or others that are successful. But Americans do not like to learn. We like to teach. We wanna tell Japan and the world what to do, how to be better. And so, my work and my attitude is, is somewhat out of place. Uh, but I want to say, again, there is nothing about Japan which is as significant as over a half century of reduced violent crimes, period. No country has matched the Japanese example. And the United States is the worst example of all. And we incarcerate more people than any country in the world as a rate of incarceration. Great, we have uh, two questions at least. Um, Mr. Lynch, Philip Lynch. Uh, let's see, uh, Ulrike, uh, you had a question as well. Yes, thank you. Uh, it's great to see everybody. Great to see you, John. It's, uh, good to see you in great spirits and Mark as well. Uh, I have a little bit of a normative question, I guess. Uh, so the, the problem with crime, of course, I don't have to tell you, is that we don't, there's a, the crime statistics only tell us the numbers of crimes that we found, not the numbers of crimes that are actually committed. And so that's always this big issue there. And one of the uh, cases you found here is rape. And so you brought it up, so I'll go right down there, that road. Um, are you saying that the number of rapes is down and that is a, a true reflection of what's happening in Japan? Or are you saying that uh, if a man rapes a woman, let's just say, and um, uh, repents and says, oh, I'm so sorry, uh, I didn't mean to do that, you know, and we, we all know about Japan's hierarchical society and the role of men and women. I don't, in this group, I don't even have to go down that road, right? Um, and the woman says, oh yeah, okay. Then in Japan, this rape never happened. 
And so therefore it does not enter the statistics and then therefore the statistics look uh, beautiful. Can you parse that out a little bit more to us? And, and this, this concept of apologizing and then therefore it goes away uh, as a, and that's a normative part of my question, as a sort of, okay, a whitewashing kind of process. Uh, you know, I, I'd like to wrap my head around that a little bit more. I'm, I'm delighted that you used that example. And the first question is, uh, do we know the, the incidences of rape in Japan versus the United States? And my, you know, I have no idea how many rapes are take place. We have to remember defining rape may be different in Japanese law than US law, but in any case, uh, sexual abuse, rapes, uh, I assume there are more cases than are actually reported. And therefore there are more cases that actually occur than there are in terms of criminal statistics. The question I have is why would we think in Japan at least, that there was more likely that a person would report a rape in 1955, in 1960, than in 2005 or 2012. I don't think of any reason why that would occur. So the numbers of reported rapes, and therefore determined its offenders, has been going down. If in fact, this is a question mark, your question, but my question as well, if there are more rapes occurring but no one is reporting, then those statistics may not be quite as valid. But I want to tell you two stories, back to your normative uh, question. The first story is an American story. There was a swimmer at a major university in the United States. He went to a party, he got drunk. He was a swimmer so for the, the school. There was a girl at the a young woman at the party. And she got drunk, and after the party, uh, he he did something, and we considered it to be a sexual abuse. Whether it's rape or not, I'm not sure. He apologized. He said he was sorry, and the judge sentenced, found him guilty, and sentenced him to several months in prison. Now, of course, because he's a sex offender. He will be a sex offender for almost life, and he must report wherever he lives to the proper authorities. And it's available online. I can go check all the sex offenders. The judge gave him just a few months. The reaction in California, it was a California university, a California swimmer, the reaction in California was outstanding. People complained, they changed the law. The judge was excoriated. Now, there's another case, there's another, two cases in Japan, which took place almost at the same time. One was involved an actor, a young actor's a hotel. He raped a hotel worker in his room. She complained, he apologized, his mother made a public apologies. They compensated the hotel worker and the hotel worker said, hey, I'm fully comp compensated. I quote, pardoned the offender. Now it was reported because that's not a trivial offense. The prosecutor suspended prosecution in that case. There was no conviction, no sentencing. But there's another case. A Tokyo undergraduate raped another woman. No question, it was a real rape. He apologized, he, they found the woman, they offered a settlement, she refused the settlement. Prosecutors did not suspend prosecution. It was prosecuted. The court found him guilty, but didn't execute the sentence. He spent no time in jail. Now, query, do you think that either of these two Japanese or that American swimmer are ever going to repeat their experience? But one went to jail. One is a permanent sex offender. The other two we just know from newspaper accounts or reporting who they were and what happened to them. Now, their reputation within their community is, is damaged. Their family's reputation within the community is damaged. There is, quote, shame, as uh, John Brayford would say, attached to this. And that is an effective sanction, as John Braithwaite has argued many times. But there's no incarceration. The criminal justice system, and I don't think any of those, quote, rapists would ever do that again. 
we don't need to punish in order to prevent. But I say there are many factors in Japan. Japan does not have a retributive culture, but we do. Everything I read in the California reaction to the Stanford swimmers uh, uh, conviction and, and sentencing is evidence of it. We believe that if a crime is committed, there must be as a moral duty to punish and punish in relationship to what the crime was committed. I think that is morally wrong and I think it is de detrimental to the society and the criminal justice system. But that puts me at odds with most Americans. Great, thanks, John. Um, let's uh, please remember, though, we already have uh, seven people lined up. Uh, so um, let's I'm, I'm uh, me, yeah. <laughs> so keep the, let's keep the uh, questions short and the answers short. Um, Susan Farr. Thank you, John. Uh, so much appreciate uh, enjoy yeah. the presentation. Uh, <clears throat> the story you told today is so different from the story we got at the time of Carlos Ghosn, Nissan's executive in his uh, encounter with the legal system. And I'm, I'm interested in, from your standpoint, it, the system you've described is the system that Japanese are operating in. Does it work in the same way with foreigners, uh, with international uh, people accused of crimes, and specifically on the issue of access to counsel? Uh, that was a major issue that he was, if I understand it, he was allowed counsel, but not an international lawyer. And why, how can you explain this uh, provision, if I'm correct? Well, I, I think to my, there are two reasons that mm -hmm. I think, or two explanations mm -hmm. I would have. And, and, and both are the fact that this is not a Japanese defendant. And the first is that Japanese can't assume that non-Japanese offendant will respond in the same way that Japanese do. They're not part of the cultural, they're not part of the community, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So it, one, ex, one, one answer is uh, they may be treated differently, but I'm not sure that. The other is, and I think this is very clear from all the cases I know, the foreign defendant does not respond the way the Japanese do. There, I don't think that, he ever said, I'm sorry. I confessed, I did wrong, I'm sorry. I put myself at the mercy of the criminal justice system in Japan. He said, I want a lawyer, and my lawyer's gonna defend me. You can't do anything to me. You can't ask me any questions unless I can say no comment. I watch a lot of mysteries, so I have no, not, no comment. Uh, and so the result is, he, he is not going to have the advantages of someone who confesses, shows attrition, is willing to be accountable, and therefore, you move into another direction. Okay, uh, Christina. My question is also related to Susan's and the written question from Len Shofa about how a community-based legal system interacts with foreigners, and so, Susan asked uh, Carlos Ghosn and Len Shofa asks about foreign residents negotiating the system and whether they know that a confession is so powerful. I would also wonder, does the increase of foreign residents break down the possibility of a communitarian reputation-based enforcement? And I was surprised that you see Japanese law performing even better with lower crime rates when urbanization has reduced the pull of reputation. And so somehow, even as there's not a small town reputation, Japan's law has held up. And does that mean that even foreigners will also be brought into the system, educated and comply? What are your prospects for engaging with foreigners? Well, I think the foreigner must understand the Japanese system. And I'm not sure that the Japanese system is explained very much. I hope the foreigners read what I've written and can say, hey, this is something that works. But I think reputation works in the contemporary system, even though it's highly urbanized. And that is, it may be urbanized, but most Japanese are employed within communities. The company they work for the bureaucracy they work for. And these are lifetime employment communities. And the reputation of the community is affected by what members do. 
And so, for example, I know of no case, not a single case, of a judge accepting a bribe in Japan in the post-war period. I haven't even looked at the pre-war period. But every judge I ask tells me that they know of no case of a judge taking a bribe. I don't know of a single country in the world where they can say there's no case of a judge taking a bribe in our legal system over the past 60, 70 years. Why? Well, one explanation is if a judge takes a bribe, it affects all judges. And, and judges in Japan are moved around the country, like prosecutors, moved around the country. If they are not with their family, and, and with their family, they live in apartment houses for judges. And so they're interacting, and there's three judge panels as the normal trial court. And so they're interacting with judges at all levels. And so it's very hard to take a bribe in Japan. You'd have to bribe three judges at the trial level for the most part. And so it explains that. But I think what is happening here is that there is a combination of a value that says you don't take a bribe, that reputation matters even in an urban setting. And so the Japanese system works, at least for Japanese. When the foreigner is in included, the non-Japanese are included, I think it works pretty much the same way, assuming they respond the way Japanese would respond. I, I think that the foreigner doesn't respond that way. And every case I know of, you know, it's, I, I, in one of those papers, I mentioned a case where some soldiers were accused of rape and they, the, the, the lawyer was a good friend of mine. And he said, you know, the hard part was I told them to confess. I told them to do this. They did all the things I told them. But when they got to court, the judge says, you have anything to say? And then they said, we're not guilty. And the judge says, oh, my goodness. And the lawyer said, oh, all that effort compensating the victims, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, wasted, and they were sentenced to prison. Thanks, John. Um, Philip Lynch has a mic problem and asked me to read a question. Can you say something about the history of the Japanese criminal legal system as you've described it? Is what you've described strictly post-World War II? It sounds terrific, but how did it evolve? Well, I can't tell you uh, how the system worked in the pre-war period. I don't think uh, that it changed much. I, I, my inclination is to say that basically the pre-war system was very similar, if not the same. Uh, but, but I've not looked, I have not access to the data in the pre-war period, and so I haven't tried to deal with it. But the post-war period is clear. We have lots of data. Thanks. Um, Keiko Kawabe. Ms. Kawabe? Hello, sorry, I took a minute to unmute. Thank you, Professor Haley, for this uh, wonderful talk. I am, you, you mentioned uh, that you accompanied a man in the 70s to this meeting in Japan with prosecutors, but you haven't said anything about any interaction between um, Americans who are in the criminal justice system uh, currently. And in my study of what activists are looking at, it doesn't really seem like there is much interest or knowledge amongst Americans of what the Japanese criminal justice system is getting right. Um, I'm wondering if I'm just unaware and if you know of people who are, are looking to Japan for lessons or if, um, if there just is little to no interest. I, I think there's interest in Japan's criminal justice system, but as I indicated before, I think the interest by non-Japanese tends to be what is Japan doing wrong? How can we, what can Japan learn from us or learn from other countries, industrial democracies that will improve their system? Almost all of the literature I read in English on Japanese criminal justice system written by non-Japanese tends to show negatives. My favorite example is the criticism that you can be held in detention for 23 days without a court warrant. Well, no one that I know of has ever looked at how many people are held in detention first. Secondly, they don't compare it to the US. And this study that uh, I have to go back and it's in my uh, punish or prevent paper, uh, on American jails, that there are thousands of people held in American jails. The significant numbers are innocent, turn out to be innocent. 
And unless they can put bail, they stay there for an average of 23 days. So the American system on that basis alone is far worse than the Japanese system. So I don't criticize Japan for the 23 day requirement. Thanks. Um, so um, Lawrence, uh, Lawrence Ropetta, are you in Tokyo at uh, one o'clock in the morning? Uh, you're muted. You're muted. Okay, can you hear me now? There you go. I'm see on you. the West Coast, Mark. I'm in Seattle. Yeah. Good okay, to good. See you. Um, Professor Haley, a brilliant lecture. Um, I wish we could have all enjoyed it in person. Um, in your talk, uh, you didn't say much about defense counsel and the role played by defense counsel. I think you'd agree that, you know, police and prosecutors and judges are human and not everyone they charge is certainly guilty. Um, and so could you say a few words? I mean, of course, it's the role of defense counsel to represent the suspect and perhaps to attempt to prove innocence um, or at least to persuade prosecutors not to charge and so forth. And it's often pointed out that, for example, in that initial 23-day period, counsel are not allowed to be present during the interrogations. Uh, and I, th I think probably in all or nearly all industrial democracies, counsel are allowed to be present during the interrogations. So tell us a little bit about your, your view of the role of defense counsel. I think defense counsel have almost no role in the criminal justice system to the extent that they wish that their client is released without trial or without reporting to the prosecutor. Uh, what can they say? What can they do? They have to explain to their, in my view, they would have to explain to their client, hey, you, if you committed this crime, you need to confess it. You need to find someone who's going to have contact with the victim, offer a settlement, get the victim to pardon you, and then you'll have the easier time. I can't imagine an, an American lawyer, an American or a European lawyer saying that to the client. They will tell the client, don't say anything. Don't confess. Don't say you're guilty. And if they do say you're guilty in the United States, or I think in most European systems, hey, there's, there's no trial. It can go immediately to sentencing, at least in the US. I can't speak for the European systems. So I think the role of defense counsel is very, very limited. Thanks. Um, and most of them don't have defense counsel as a result. Thanks. Allison, are you checking in from Ann Arbor? Thanks so much. I was thinking about Carlos Ghosn as well. I figure, um, I, like when, when all of that was going down, all of a sudden, all of my friends and relatives who have no relationship to Japan were asking me like, what on earth is going on? <laughs> so I was just thinking about that example as well as a moment when um, Japan's sort of normative system was really being questioned internationally. Um, so I think you've already answered it, but thank you so much. And thanks for all your work. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, and Bruce, Bruce Aronson. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, John, it's great to hear your talk. Um, I'm new to criminal justice in Japan because of focus I've had on the last year or so on the Gone case, more from a corporate governance perspective, but I found it necessary to get drawn into criminal justice. And I, my respect for people who try comparative criminal justice has increased dramatically. Um, as judged by Japan's so-called 99% conviction rate, it's really hard to compare data. They aren't readily uh, comparable. So those who try that, I, I respect. I think the systems in Japan and the US have made different choices. Um, what I want to ask John, because of his broad background, is, is two related questions. Um, one, does it make a difference that Japan is a civil law country? Um, you mentioned Europe, but my understanding is that in Europe, under the inquisitorial system, a judge might not be happy if the defendant did not participate at all in the truth-finding process and merely said, I'm not talking, I'm not guilty. Uh, again, I'm not expert on this, and I have read that Japan and the post-war occupation supposedly changed uh, substantially from the inquisitorial system to a more American-style adversarial system. But that's such a basic, broad point. I don't see many people trying to apply that to specific cases, like the Gone case, which I'm interested in. So that's one. And the second question is, um, 
different strengths and weaknesses in the two systems. And I don't disagree with your evaluation that your Japan system is better overall, judging by the results. Um, nevertheless, in Japan, um, as in the Gone case, prosecutors can control the process and end up with very substantial periods of pretrial detention. Um, even, even though you have a theoretical right to remain silent, you must attend interrogation for up to eight hours a day without an attorney. So are, are these areas that are truly in need of reform or are just, they're okay, and then the cost the system pays when you always have to pay a cost when you have limited resources available to achieve good results? I would, I would answer that by um, saying, let's see if I can make sure I understand, remember the, which question to answer. Um, if you are guilty, in Japan, you're guilty, you, you committed the crime, and the police arrest you, and you're reported to the prosecutor, and the prosecutor's now detaining you and questioning you. If you are counsel for that person, what would you tell them to do? Well, I would tell them, as my co former colleague and then attorney Fujita told his clients, American clients who are accused of rape, he said, you confess. You should tell them you're sorry and you should find some ways to compensate the victims and get the victim's pardon. That's what he told them. Then they got to court and they said they weren't guilty. <laughs> they didn't follow, they didn't understand or follow his advice. If my client is not guilty, then I want to be cooperative with the prosecutor. I want to say, here's all the evidence I can give you. But my client didn't do it. And I know of cases after case after case of people who were brought in for, they weren't detained, they were brought in for interrogation by the police or the prosecutor and they, did, and they cooperated. They simply said, we didn't do it. You, there's no evidence or provable evidence that you can show that we did it. And I believe that the police, the prosecutors and the judges are really concerned about finding the truth. I don't think a prosecutor in Japan cares about winning cases. It's finding the truth. And so if you can assist the prosecutor in finding the truth, the pro and you're cooperative, your chances of being released are a lot better. The people, I, I, don't know the, I don't know the data on how many people are actually detained in Japan. I do know the data on how many people are arrested and put into jail. And I, was, I am absolutely certain that our jails are full and Japanese detention centers are almost empty. So um, I've taken over. This is very uh, typical of the Zoom life that Professor Ramsey would have to actually go teach his uh, law school class at one. Um, and so I'm going to give a voice. I hope she's still here. Mary Alice Haddad. Uh, and I'll just go through maybe uh, three or four more questions uh, and we'll just go over a few minutes. Uh, so Mary Alice. Oh, good to see you, Mary Alice. Thank you for sure, joining. I'm still here. Um, I don't know if you can see me. I unmuted myself, but maybe not. Um, I uh, was, this was a great uh, talk, Professor Haley. Uh, thank you for sharing it with us. As it turned out, I was covering um, the Japanese legal system on Tuesday in my Japanese politics class. And what a week between Ruth Bader Ginsburg's passing and the Breonna Taylor um, lack of guilt in any way or even lack of uh, arrests. Uh, it sort of threw the Japanese legal system into stark relief with the American one. And I was curious whether you had any reflections uh, based on your lengthy experience in Japan about what we might learn from what they do in Japan to improve our own system, not just in terms of not arresting quite as many people, but sort of system-wide. Thank you. So I'm, John, I'm going to just collect a few more. Uh, yeah, and so I want to give uh, uh, Professor Len Shopa, if you're still Len, are you still there? You had an earlier post, which may have been answered with regards. There we go. Good to see you, Len. Very good. Um, yes, I am still here. And my earlier question was answered. Thanks to Christina for asking it for me. And I, I look forward to joining John later. Thanks. Okay, sounds good. Uh, I guess, Fred Meyer, you have a comment. Do you want to make, it seems like a Mark West kind of a comment, but it's sort of interesting if you're still here. It's one of those things in which I may not be able to catch everything. 
Okay, so why don't we uh, go with uh, Professor Mariel Sadat's question then. If I may, I'd like to go back to the first question that Bruce asked, uh, that is, oh, okay. does it make any difference in a civil law system? And my answer is, I don't think so. Um, the reason I don't think so is because it's civil law systems versus common law systems, we're really talking about private law for the most part. In this terms of the structure of courts, the role of judges, etc., there are differences. Uh, but the Japanese system reflects its criminal justice system reflects the pre-war, the structure of the pre-war system. The criminal code in Japan is a, I've forgotten exactly the date, of 1907, one of the last of the major codes to be enacted. Uh, it's based on what is considered to be the most progressive German criminal code. It was not, it was, it was amended in part, but it, there's no new code. Uh, there was one effort to create a grand jury system, Mark West has written on this, but the grand jury system and Thomas Blakemore, the lawyer who I worked under, uh, was involved with criminal justice reforms during the occupation. He was told by a superior, and there are only two or three superiors, uh, that they should have a, introduce a grand jury system. He wrote a memo, which I have a copy of. Uh, I know it was his because I knew his handwriting, because it's not signed or uh, autographed in any way, but uh, he refused. And he introduced the prosecutorial review commissions uh, to review, pro to make sure that there's no prosecutorial misconduct. Uh, so they don't have a grand jury system. So it's a civil law system, but it doesn't, it's very much on its, a, a progressive civil law system. Uh, and the differences with uh, criminal justice, I think are procedural, relatively small, except for the points that I've made already. Okay, thank you so much, Professor well, Haley. This was, the, excuse oh, me, then sorry. I have to answer I'm sorry. The question, <laughs> excuse me, about the, the policing in Japan. Well, you know, Japan doesn't have a, a Second Amendment. Uh, there, there are no guns in Japan. But the police don't carry guns either. And I think the police tend to be very careful uh, of, I don't know if any of the listeners have ever seen a demonstration in Japan, a public protest movement. Uh, I've seen a couple back in the 60s and uh, the police control them extraordinarily well without violence. Uh, but my favorite story is the story about the Almsect. Uh, the Almsect was responsible for the chemical bombing in Tokyo's major subway station right there in the government district, uh, killed several thousand people or wounded several thousand people. They went to the, the police were raiding the Aum headquarters out in rural Japan. And they marched up to the building, no guns, didn't carry guns. What did they carry? Canaries because they wanted to make certain that they would be aware of any chemical weapons that were thrown at them. And I love that. They, they, they took over the, 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 the headquarters, the people were, were uh, arrested, and uh, I think the head of it was, may still not have been prosecuted. I don't know what's happened to him, but he's been, uh, he may have been in detention for a long period of time. <laughs> in any case, the police are extraordinarily careful. They are highly professional. There's no police force that I can know of where it's uniformly as good as Japanese police. It's not a national police force. These are prefectural police, but they are just like the prosecutors, judges. They are in a group, a community in which uh, each person feels responsible for the welfare of the community as a whole. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Haley. Uh, this was really uh, fantastic. It was just a superb model of having a relatively short presentation, but being willing to answer every question. Uh, so we're all grateful that uh, you're able to share your time with us. And it was wonderful also to have our colleagues from San Diego to Michigan to uh, other places that I see on the screen, Virginia. And I'm sorry I missed anyone. So please join me in, in thanking either literally cla clapping or also on the, on the screen clapping uh, uh, to Professor John Haley for this fantastic uh, seminar. And this will be online as a video, so um, thank you can you. look for that on our Twitter account. So thank you so much, Professor Haley. Thank you for having me.